I was, I basically started one of the new sections of science. The one that was, existed already was basically former editors the Harvard's Crimson covering the politics of science. Mm -hmm. So I was actually covering the science of science. So I was writing physics for the biologists and biology for the physicists, thinking, yeah. okay, there's Scientific American for the scientists. Mm -hmm. There's popular science for the blue collar guys. Where is it for the college educated non-scientists? So I proposed launching a magazine to serve that audience to the organization that publishes science, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And to my surprise, they more or less said yes. And it seemed to go well enough that after a year, the editor said, you know, build me a section, go hire more people like yourself. And so we did. And, and we had a lot of fun with it for years. So we launched it and about the fourth issue, Time Inc. announced it was coming in with a competitor and Hearst launched a competitor too. So we were competing with the big boys and then we beat them in advertising sales. We won national magazine awards, which they didn't. And generally they were quite embarrassed and eventually Time Inc. bought us. I see. And the, the AAAS to their miscredit sold it. Well, the thing I learned, among other things, in running that science magazine is that I like starting things, and I was reasonably good at it. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily good in running a business, but starting it, you know, okay. Yeah. After we um, had the house here, we were spending weekends swearing at the dial-up, right? <laughs> I was at the time doing a lot of work in developing countries on internet access. And I knew that wireless was the right way to connect a rural area. There was new technology that, you know, I mean, if I could build a Wi-Fi based phone system in rural Vietnam, why the hell couldn't we do it here? So I mumbled right. about this to, to somebody um, in town whose name I've now forgotten. But he said, you know, the county council's really interested in this question of connectivity because the businesses are dying. Would you come and talk to them about this idea? So I, so I did and explained why I thought it would be viable. And they said, would you please um, start it? And how can we help? And I said, I need access to all the towers, mm -hmm. right? And, and your informal blessing. And I would do it if I could raise local money to back it. So I you know, wrote the prospectus, the business plan, and, and uh, found the right consultants to help, and then basically followed the network of people who have money around here and talked to them about it. And we did raise close to a million dollars locally. We started, started Bay Bay. the ambitions we had was actually to um, build a, a, a ring that went, started in Baltimore, came across the bay to here, went all the way down the shore, jumped back across to Southern Maryland so that you had internet from both sides and had a release and then hook up the colleges, hook up the businesses and then hook up the residences. I raised, uh, I think it was a four and a half million loan from Department of Agriculture, um, which we got through all the processes um, about, about five months or six months after we started the company. But they needed, they wanted a matching investment, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and I, it wasn't really a good way to tap that uh, next round here. Mm -hmm. So I went looking for VC money. Mm -hmm. And I found a small sort of private VC group up in New Jersey mm -hmm. who were, was interested. In fact, they were the only people I found who, who were seriously interested. And they were willing to put in a million and a half dollars or whatever it was. I mean, they were sharks. I knew what they would do to me, right? <laughs> but I didn't really want to run the company. I wanted to be a customer of it. Yeah. So, um, and they had a lot of experience. They'd run cable things. They'd run, um, you know, uh, cellular systems. So they, I thought they knew what they were doing. So they came in and six months later kicked me out. And... <clears throat> and that was fine, except that they didn't do a very good job running the company. So, so no, I, I wasn't bothered by being kicked out. I was, I was bothered by the fact that they screwed it up. Yeah. Didn't do what they, yeah. what I 
told people we could do. So then they sold out to this group in Pennsylvania, Wave Vision. Oh, I see. And they didn't put any money into it, but they ran it for, for a good number of years. Mm -hmm. And then they went bankrupt, what, last year. Okay. I'm not ready to sit in a rocking chair yet. <laughs> so I like to get engaged in things. And to me, the, the real issue in Chestertown is how is it going to be economically and socially viable? Mm -hmm. And I'm not somebody that thinks tourism is the answer to that. Mm -hmm. It's just not enough revenue coming from that. So I'm interested in things that um, can create jobs, that can attract people, that you know have opportunities for younger people to stay instead of leaving, uh, and all those kinds of things. And and some of them are broader Eastern Shore things too. We're sort of living through two transitions in energy. One is the transition away from fossil fuels to clean tech. And, you know, not everybody's bought into that yet, but uh, it's going to happen. But it's going to take a while. And in the short term time, what's really happening is we're transitioning out of coal into natural gas as the fundamental fuel supply for heating houses and for generating electricity.